Good morning, and welcome to worship at Emmanuel Lutheran Church in Parker's Prairie, Minnesota, on this Labor Day weekend, this 14th Sunday after Pentecost. Appropriately, for the times that we live in, our epistle that's appointed for this day speaks about uh, the governing authorities and how we ought to treat them. And so good words for us to reflect upon this morning. Our opening hymn uh, speaks a bit about our government uh, that God has given us and our country. Before you, Lord, we bow. Uh, we join together as we sing our opening hymn. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God, our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you and for his sake, forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 
the words of our intro it on this 14th Sunday after Pentecost from Psalm 92. How great are your works, O Lord! Your thoughts are very deep. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praises to your name, O Most High, to declare your steadfast love in the morning and your faithfulness by night, to the music of the lute and the harp, to the melody of the lyre. For you, O Lord, have made me glad by your work, at the works of your hands I sing for joy. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. How great are your works, O Lord! Your thoughts are very deep. We join now in our hymn of praise. This is the Feast of Victory for our God. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O God, from whom all good proceeds, grant to us, your humble servants, your holy inspiration that we may set our minds on the things that are right and, by your merciful guiding, accomplish them. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Old Testament reading for this 14th Sunday after Pentecost is from Ezekiel chapter 33, verses 7 to 9. Ezekiel is called to be a watchman for the people of Israel, to speak God's word to them 
uh, words of warning when so needed. So you, son of man, I have made a watchman for the house of Israel. Whenever you hear a word from my mouth, you shall give them warning from me. If I say to the wicked, O wicked one, you shall surely die, and you do not speak to warn the wicked to turn him from his way, that wicked person shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. But if you warn the wicked to turn from his way, and he does not turn from his way, that person shall die in his iniquity, but you will have delivered your soul. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle from Romans in the 13th chapter, words which serve as our sermon text today. Note what St. Paul writes about uh, government and its role. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval, for he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For the same reason, you also pay taxes. For the authorities are ministers of God, attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is is owed. Owe no one anything except to love each other, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel is from St. Matthew in the 18th chapter. Uh, familiar words of our Lord. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus, saying, Who is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And, calling to him a child, he put him in the midst of them and said, Truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. Woe to the world for temptations to sin. For it is necessary that temptations come, but woe to the one by whom the temptation comes. And if your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life crippled or lame than with two hands or two feet to be thrown into the eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into the hell of fire. 
See that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I tell you that in heaven their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. For the Son of Man came to save the lost. What do you think? If a man is a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine on the mountains and go in search of the one that went astray? And if he finds it, truly I say to you, he rejoices over it more than over the ninety-nine that never went astray. So it is not the will of my Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you, if two of you agree on, in, on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We join now in our sermon hymn, O God, my faithful God. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text again from Romans 13. 
It is amazing how Scripture speaks to any and every situation. And certainly the words of our text today are more than fitting for the days that we live in. Days in which there is unrest throughout our land, when there are riots and, and protests, various sides and factions, in which the parties are at odds with each other and sometimes work not for the good of the land but for their, their own uh, welfare and well-being. And so it is very timely that we look at our text and, and consider what it says about government and how what our role as citizens <coughs> excuse me, are in this land and, and how that all fits in with our faith. We do so in, in three parts. Uh, we see, first of all, from our text, that all authority comes from God. Pretty simple, right? Because God is the source of authority. Because God is God. To be God means you you are in control, you have authority, you have all power. After all, God is the one who made this world. And so, of course, he designed and established its rules. The fourth commandment about obeying parents and authorities and, and all the rest. And among the, the things that God gives us as he made this world and its structures is government. And government is a good thing. It's a good way to, to organize countries and, and areas. Someone has to make decisions to be the leader, to be in control, to be responsible. That is the role and function of government. Our text says, verse 4, Government is God's servant for your good. It's the role of our earthly leaders. Life is better when there is peace and order and, and structure and rules. And when all of that provides opportunities, safety, harmony, life is good. Government is doing its job. <coughs> but government also has another purpose, and that is to punish those who do wrong. St. Paul says again, but if you do wrong, be afraid. Government does not bear the sword in vain. Government is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Government is there to punish those who break the laws. And it's God's will that those people be punished. The government carries out God's vengeance fines, jail, even capital punishment. They are all given by God to government as tools at their disposal. The government is God's agent to show God's wrath at those who break the law in bad and serious ways. God's agent to execute justice, to do that which is right, to remedy wrongs as much as possible. It is not up to us individually to be the avenger when someone wrongs us. No, that is the role of government. And we are glad when they do it and that it is not us because if everyone was to avenge themselves, life would be full of chaos and danger. And in our text, God says government also has the right to levy taxes. Money is needed to do its job and to pay its bills. <coughs> and so this too, government does. All authority comes from God, my friends, and that includes government. Secondly, then, in our text, we would look at what is our role as citizens in this government. Verse 1 says, let every person be subject to the governing authorities. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities. You see, that is, that is us. We are called to, to be subjects, to be subject to the governing authorities, because these authorities have been instituted by God for our good. 
God has put government into place. And so to resist government is to resist God and those whom God has appointed and set up. Rulers, St. Paul says, they should not be a terror to good conduct. You shouldn't be terrified of them if you're doing good. But when you do bad, yes, you ought to be terrified. If you want not to be afraid of those in authority, St. Paul says, well, then do what is good. Government will approve. But if you do wrong, be afraid because government does not bear the sword in vain. Do good. Oh, obey the laws. In fact, St. Paul says, doing so, we don't just obey the laws to avoid punishment, but we do so as a matter of conscience. That as Christians, we want to obey God, and we want to obey those whom he has put into place, and so it is our conscience which requires us also uh, to obey the law, even if we know we perhaps could get away with it or something like that, yet our conscience compels us to do that which is right. And St. Paul adds taxes, revenue, respect, honor. Uh, all of those are to be given. Now, of course, that doesn't mean that we are always going to like our government, our leaders, that we're always going to agree with them or think that they have made the best decisions. Yeah, that's true. And yet they're responsible and, and we are not. But we do have the right and the duty to protest. It's a duty given us in our Constitution. But we do so lawfully. We don't break one law to protest another. And we have the ability not just to protest, but to speak. That is to persuade, to speak the truth, to argue. And we have the right and privilege to vote and the responsibility and, and even to run for office if we think we can do a better job than those who are currently in office. <coughs> We may not always like or agree what our government does, but we have ways of, of dissenting and expressing that, and also then ways that would be inappropriate. What about if government is wrong? If what the rules that they make are, are wrong? Well, it is still not our responsibility to, to go and, and to break one law to try to keep another law. We live in a country that allows abortions, and we know that, that that is wrong. But the government doesn't force us to get one. We don't have to get one. And we can speak boldly about the truth of the value of life. Our country allows gay marriage. Likewise, we don't have to do that, but we can speak boldly about God's plan for marriage, for men and for women. Uh, assisted suicides. It's an issue in our country. Euthanasia. We can be advocates for life on these issues. We can speak up for that which is right and true. We need to. We should. It is both our privilege and our responsibility. It's only if government would order us to do something that goes against Scripture, then we refuse. And we are willing to suffer the consequences for refusing. If the government makes a law that requires us to do something that is contrary to God's word and, and specifies the punishments, well, we obey God and his word rather than men. And we're willing to accept whatever punishments the government may put into place. That is our role as Christian citizens in our land. And then... Thirdly and finally, one last component to all of this, and that is that the gospel wins. The gospel wins over the law, over government. Jesus was put to death by a political leader. He was put to death unjustly, and yet he allowed it to happen. In fact, it was the greatest injustice ever. He didn't step in, though he could have, and stopped it. He did not. He was put to death, and for a greater purpose. The gospel, you see, wins and triumphs, not the law. 
forgiveness, forgiveness for our sins. We rejoice not in how perfectly we've kept the laws of our land, but we rejoice in the forgiveness that is ours in Christ. The forgiveness that Jesus offers to all who repent. The sins of our leaders as they repent, the sins of those in our own party when they repent, the sins of those in the other party when, when they repent. All who trust in the Lord and turn to him receive forgiveness, which is far more important. You see, the absolute goal is not that we would have a perfect world or a perfect government. There is no such thing. It is impossible in a fallen world. If that was the goal, if that was achievable, then, then any means might be justified to achieve it. But my friends, the absolute goal is not a perfect government. Even if we were the dictator, we couldn't do it perfectly. No, the absolute goal is a gospel goal. The absolute goal is heaven. It is the goal. We want heaven full. God wants heaven full, every soul saved. And so, yes, there's times we suffer on this earth. And when we do, we give good witness. If our activities would give Christianity a bad name, then that's a sad thing. We're willing to suffer injustice for the sake of Christ, for the sake of His name that we bear, that our actions and our activities would not harm the gospel. The last verses of our text, Oh, no one anything except love. All the commandments are summed up in this, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Love is the fulfilling of the law. We are called to love our neighbor, to love them into heaven, that by our kindness and by our example and by our words, the Holy Spirit might give them the gift of faith and bring them into the kingdom. Yes, my friends, we are called to be subject to the government authorities. We know that that that's God's institution, that government. And it's necessary in a fallen world. And we are thankful for the government and we work to make it as good as possible. We exercise our voice. We exercise our vote in this kingdom on earth, the kingdom of power, the kingdom of the world. And yet, our goal is not a perfect government. Our goal is the kingdom of God that we and all people would be a part of that kingdom, of the kingdom of faith and forgiveness and eternal life. And so as we live our lives under two kingdoms, the government of the state and, and the government of the church, the kingdom of the church, so it is the kingdom of the church that is the ultimate authority, the ultimate goal, and we live our lives most of all to fill that kingdom, to bring people into that kingdom, to rejoice in our citizenship there. My friends, may God bless you to that end, to your eternal status in the kingdom of God, and to your bringing as many as possible to join you in that kingdom. That is our goal. That is our end. It is what pleases God who has saved us and gives us these good things. And that, my friends, is the way that it is in this year of our Lord, 2020. In Jesus' name, amen. In response now to God and to his word to us, we confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. 
He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We go now to our Lord in prayer. Almighty God, Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of government, uh, the government that is ours. Even at times when we disagree with some of our leaders, we thank you for government and for its role and purpose and authority in our lives, um, in our communities, in our country. We pray, dear Lord, that you would guide our leaders, help them to know and to do your will, to know that which is best and right and pleasing to you, enable them to follow their consciences and to know your word and your truths, your commands. Lord, bless our government and, and bless our country in this process of elections that, that you would cause to be elected those who would best serve our land. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And Heavenly Father, we, on this uh, Labor Day weekend, we give you the thanks for our vocations, for the jobs and roles that you have given to us. Help us to fill them well, to serve to the best of our ability. We pray that you would bless all employees, enable them to carry out their roles and responsibilities well and faithfully, eagerly, joyfully. We pray for all employers that they would serve well in that role, that they would be fair to their employees, that they would be clear and honest with them and provide a good environment for work and accomplishing uh, their jobs. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, we pray for those who need jobs, who are lacking uh, vocations, who, who do not have jobs that, that provide for their families. Dear Lord, we pray that you would enable them to find a job, that you would provide employers who can use them and, and employ them. We pray, O oh Lord, that those who are in need would be taken care of. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty God, in this time of, of COVID-19, we again come to you and pray that you would end this pandemic, that you would use your almighty powers, and pray that you would be with us during this time as well, that you would give us wisdom in living in these days, that we would love our neighbor and that, that we would look out for those um, who are in danger, um, whose lives might be in peril. Pray that you would heal those who are ill and be with those who are in health care. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty God, we pray that you would be with our teachers and students as school begins this week in, in our area, that, that you would enable school to go well, that you would prevent there from being illnesses or problems, and that uh, learning about your world might take place in each classroom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And Almighty God, we pray this day also for the many people who are ill, the people in our own congregation. Lord, you know each one, and, and the people among our friends and families and communities, uh, those we name now in our hearts. Lord, be with each of these people, most of all, enable them to know your love and your care, and, and we pray that it would be your will to grant them full healing. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands, O oh Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who has taught us all to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace.
peace. Amen. We join now in singing our closing hymn, Forth in the Peace of Christ We Go. Thank you for joining us in worship this morning. We pray God's blessings upon you this coming week. A couple of announcements uh, for those in the area. Uh, confirmation uh, meetings for 7th, 8th, and 9th graders will be taking place this coming Wednesday. Um, 7th graders at 6.30, 8th graders 7.15, 9th graders at 8 o'clock. 6th um, graders will meet uh, the following week uh, for a meeting with parents talk about the year and, and uh, how classes will be. Um, we look to have classes here at church, but also um, online options as well as needed. Next weekend, we begin a new worship schedule. So the, the simple part is that online worship will stay at 10, at least for now. Um, but the in-sanctuary worship will switch to 9 a.m., and that will be every Sunday. We'll be doing in house worship and for the rest of september starting on the 13th we will have parking lot worship at 10 30. also two weeks from today september 20th we'll be starting sunday school looking forward to that we do need a first and second grade teacher if you're interested please uh, let us know uh, we would appreciate a volunteer for that I think those are the announcements for today. Also, um, three weeks from today, we're going to start a, a reading of the Bible all the way through a two-year reading cycle. And so I uh, hope you will join us for that. We'll have the reading schedule on our website uh, very shortly. If it's not there now, uh, it'll also be in the bulletin each week. And we'll read a chapter or two a day uh, and then uh, focus on part of that each weekend uh, beginning then in October. So looking forward uh, to that. And at the end of the two years, if you've never read your Bible cover to cover, you'll be able to say, yes, I've read every word uh, that God has given us in his holy word. Thanks to uh, Jerry and Yvonne for helping with taping and to Deidre and Maureen, our musicians today. We appreciate all of those gifts. Uh, the Lord be with you and keep you in his care this coming week.